Sounds great. First of all, yeah. Oh, let me just see, continue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Rahul, for you know very generously inviting me. Uh, when I got to hear about the course, I immediately checked out the videos, and uh, that made me very nostalgic to uh, back in 2019. Uh, I was I was teaching a very similar course, obviously uh, called Mobile Robots, where we were building. We built like about you know 13 of these. Uh, one tenth size RC cars that uh, we, you know, in the course sort of build up control planning and perception. So we're very nostalgic for that course. So hopefully in uh, in the near future, I could I could come and, and see see the cars in action in person. Uh, but uh, today, uh, so hi everyone. I'm I'm Sanjivan. Uh, as Rahul mentioned, I'm a, currently a research scientist at Aurora, um, and I'll be uh, I'll be joining Cornell as assistant professor this fall. And today I'll be talking about interactive imitation learning. Uh, how do we build robots that learn from human interaction and plan alongside human partners? And in the spirit of this talk, I would love this to be interactive. So if you have questions, I guess, you know, please jump in. I, I think I can hear, hear you. So yeah, D don't hesitate. Please, please uh, ask, ask away. Um, cool. OK, so let's get started. Um, so the question at the core of my research is, how do we design robots that both understand and learn from natural human interactions? You know, for those of you who've seen this movie Baymax, this will be a very familiar scene where Hero teaches Baymax to do a fist bump. Uh, what's beautiful about the scene is that Hero, through a simple sequence of interactions, is able to communicate this novel concept of a fist bump to Baymax. Um, so the question is, how do we build such robots that continually improve and learn online to adapt to individual human preferences? Uh, there are obviously many challenges, but I think uh, today we'll talk about two fundamental challenges. So first, how should robots learn from natural human interactions? Um, you know, consider the application where you have uh, grandma receiving a brand new robot apprentice. Uh, there are a number of tasks she wants the apprentice to do in a specific way, but that's latent in her mind. So how can the robot interact with her to infer these latent preferences from you know, natural modes of feedback, like gestures, interventions, and corrections? Second, how should robots plan to accomplish these tasks alongside human partners? Um, you know, the robot must be able to anticipate how humans move, uh, understand their intent and move in a safe, predictable manner around humans. Okay, so now let's step away from personal robots and transport ourselves to the world of self-driving. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, for the past two and a half years, I've been working in self-driving at Aurora uh, with an amazing team led by Drew Bagnell. Um, a key product is the Aurora driver. This is a general suit of software and hardware designed to work on any vehicle from uh, passenger sedans to class eight trucks. Uh, my area of work uh, for, for these uh, past few years has been focused on uh, motion planning and imitation learning aspects that I'll uh, talk about today. Now, uh, before we go in, you may be wondering, what does this hunk of steel have to do with humans? The answer is quite a lot. Uh, let me show you. So this is a hyperlapse of the Aurora driver hauling goods in Texas um, without any human intervention. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see the robot drive like a human and alongside humans in the real world, uh, engaging in novel interactions like merges, lane changes, stop signs, unpredicted left turns, and much more. And if you're thinking, is this a cherry pick result? Uh, it's really not. Uh, the product is hauling goods every day. Um, and, and the really cool part is that in, we went, uh, it took us just about nine months to go from never really running on a truck to, to this result, which is, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Okay, but what is the science behind this result? That's uh, what I hope we'll get to talk about today. Um, so if you look at any one particular snapshot and you ask the central question, what is the optimal action the robot should do in this scene? You might think, why not take every rule in the official driving handbook and just apply that? Well, that would not be very useful because most of the rules of driving uh, aren't explicit. 
but rather implicit. So uh, this orchestrated chaos that you see is what some of us call traffic back home. Um, what's, uh, what's remarkable is that, uh, you know, humans are able to drive like this every single day, but it's really mind numbing for us to think about how to engineer a set of rules to get a robot to repeat this feat. Um, and so that sort of leads us to one of these insights that is uh, explicitly programming rules it can be tedious. For, for instance, in self-driving, the right rule depends very much on what other humans are doing. But we humans are able to seamlessly drive every day. So how can we implicitly program robots by having them imitate human driving? And that's one of the key pieces. Um, so just to make that a little bit more concrete, the simplest thing we can do is uh, go collect a bunch of human driving data. Uh, we think of data as a pair of state and actions. Um, so think of the state as a sufficient description of the scene. For example, you know, this is a snapshot from the truck uh, video that we saw earlier. Uh, a description might be, you know, what are the actors in the scene? Where are they located? Is there an upcoming merge and so on? Then uh, you have a control action, which could be uh, the steering angle, brake and throttle. And of course the control action could also be a, uh, a, a T second trajectory uh, that, that you're planning into the future. Um, so in this example, the human decides to go over to the left lane because they're courtesy lane changing to, you know, to the actors that are merging in. And the goal really is to learn a mapping from state to actions. And even in the simplest of settings, this can go horribly wrong. So that's what I'm hoping we'll talk about today. Okay, but uh, driving is not in isolation. Um, the robot is not the only car on the road. There are other cars, pedestrians, bicyclists. So the robot has to reason about the interactions with other actors, about what other humans can do in response to what it does, right? So, as an example, take a look at this busy, unprotected left turn, right? You have pedestrians and cars. Uh, if you simply treat every actor uh, in the scene as a uh, dynamic obstacle, um, the robot can never make this turn. It has to actively create an opening in the crowds by uh, predicting how other actors will respond uh, to its motions. Uh, so to do this, the robot has to understand the latent intents of other human actors and communicate its own intent to plan a safe path to the goal. Um, to make things a little bit more concrete before we dive in, uh, let's ground these problems in the framework of a Markov decision process, which is typically used to formalize this notion of sequential decision making. So an MDP is uh, a tuple of state actions, costs, and transitions. Uh, again, the state here is the position, velocity, uh, uh, an acceleration even of uh, the robot and other humans in the scene. The actions here are steering angle, brake, throttle. Now, the, the, the heart of the problem is that <clears throat> the first, the cost function is actually latent. I mean, you may know parts of the cost function, for example, it's probably not a good idea to collide your robot, um, but, uh, there are other aspects of the cost function that is actually latent. For example, you know, when should we be doing courtesy lane changes uh, and, 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 and so on, right? And these are in the mind of the human drivers um, and we need to use imitation learning to recover this cost function or directly the value function. So that's part one of the uh, problem. Part two is the transition function is also unknown because the state of the other, uh, because uh, it depends on the state of the other humans, how they evolve based on the actions the robot takes. So, I mean, obviously the transition function involves the dynamics of the robot. And I'm sure all of you have a, a lot of familiarity with how to model that dynamics, but the, there's also dynamics of how other people react to, to your robot uh, acting crazily on the road, right? So we need to learn this function by predicting uh, latent human intent. Okay. so. Today, we'll talk about these two challenges. First, imitation learning. How do we interact with a human to learn the optimal policy? And second, intent prediction. How do we interactively forecast human actors conditioned on uh, the actions ro the actions the robot takes? Okay, so let's begin uh, with the first challenge of imitation learning. 
Um, so I'll tell the story through the lens of, uh, you know, my first self-driving project. So this is Musher. Uh, this is an open source robotics race car project that uh, we started with a team of fantastic undergrads and grad students at UW. Um, you know, let's say we wanted to get these robots to drive indoors. Keep, keep in mind that driving is not just going from A to B in the shortest path, but more like how humans would want it to drive. So, you know, we certainly don't want to eventually keep hand engineering this behavior, but teach the robot through demonstrations of the human driving it around. Um, so here's a video of Jonathan driving the robot around, uh, around the corridors. Uh, let's say we wanted to imitate Jonathan's driving, right? Now, a standard approach to imitation learning is called behavior cloning, which is simply treating the problem as a vanilla supervised learning problem. So think of data here as a pair of states and actions that you get from Jonathan's demonstrations. Uh, you then go pick your favorite classification algorithm to map states to actions. So on the right hand side, the plot that you see is a visualization of the learned policy. So each of these lines is like a, a T second uh, you know, control trajectory and blue means good actions and red means bad. So it looks like a reasonable policy. And the idea is that if you can drive uh, both training and validation error to less than epsilon, uh, you're good to go. You have a great policy. Uh, okay, so uh, here's how the learn policy looks when we roll it out. It looked like it was going well, and then it crashed into the wall. Um, so something went horribly wrong. Uh, let's try to figure out what, what went wrong. Uh, well, remember that uh, we said that uh, the, the data that we collected to train this robot was collected off policy. Uh, from human driving, and that the learner was pretty good. It, it made at most epsilon error in, in mapping states to actions, right? Um, notice that when the learner makes an error, it goes to a new state that the human has not visited, for which there's no training data. Um, and since there's no training data, the robot may choose an arbitrarily incorrect action and it continues making mistakes, eventually going on to crash against the wall. Um, so more formally, uh, Ross and Bagnell in this seminal paper showed that um, when you're, when you're uh, learning in a, in a sequential decision-making process, errors feed back and compound. And we end up with uh, a, a performance difference between the learner and the expert uh, compounding quadratically over time. Um, and so feedback compounds errors. This is the core challenge that differentiates imitation learning from supervised learning. Um, you know, the, the, this shift in, in the input distribution is known as a covariate shift. So to better understand this, let's look at our problem somewhat abstractly. So, so we have a human policy that visits a sequence of states in any given trial. Um, if we repeat trials uh, over and over again, we see that um, the distribution of states concentrate in a region, right? Um, this is because the human's pretty good. So the humans, uh, humans always staying in a basin of good enough states. And this is the distribution of inputs that the learner sees, okay? Now, when we uh, execute the robot policy, we see the robot shoot off from this region. This is because of compounding errors caused by feedback. Um, the robot visits states that the human would never visit, uh, like you know, driving headfirst into the wall. And so if you repeat uh, this trial over and over again, we see that the robot visits a, a distribution of states that's very different from human. And so this is, Fundamentally, the problem, you know, there's a mismatch between training and test distribution. And so the 99% training error that we saw before, um, uh, or, or the epsilon training error that we saw before, was, was, is really misleading because the robot incurs a much larger error when you execute it in the real world.
Um, and in case you're wondering, uh, is this a problem that uh, that that only happened with uh, uh, with with, uh, with with the with the pro with the race cars that we're working with? It's it's really not. It's a very old problem um, that goes back all the way to the first end-to-end -end self driving car, where Dean Pomalu talked about how you know the vehicle needed to be shown how to recover to stay on the lane. Um, but the surprising thing is, after 30 years, this still remains an open problem. Um, uh, or rather a persistent problem, which is, uh, you know, these are just four of the many recent papers that talk about how uh, er cascading errors occur in closed loop systems, right? Um, so feedback compounds errors. This is a, a, a pretty pervasive problem in, in, in machine learning when we go apply it to robotics. Question is, what can we do about it? Okay, so uh, I don't know if I could, uh, maybe this would be a good time to uh, brainstorm on how, on ideas for how we can fix this problem. Maybe I'm wondering if folks in the room have some suggestions. Uh, maybe use some kind of uh, reinforcement for uh, bad decisions and good decisions and then, um, try to um, uh, um, imitate those problems in a simulator and generate as many outcomes as possible to uh, learn a better policy on a simulator first. Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent answer. Wow, you sort of jumped, jumped, jumped like ahead into advanced ways to fix this problem. But he, you know, the, so the, the proposed approach is, hey, um, how about we design a simulator where the robot gets to try out really bad actions and see the consequences of these bad actions? Um, and then, um, you know, maybe we can set this up as an RL problem where we, you know, set, set design these sort of, um, you know, cost functions for, for dying or crashing into, uh, in, into obstacles. And then we just, you know, train, uh, set this as a train, a train your favorite RL agent to solve this problem. And that sounds like a fine proposition except uh, RL is really hard. <laughs> I, I, I don't know uh, how many of you have, have experienced getting RL working on a real robot, but um, you know, RL is, uh, you would end up with a lot of um, busted robots if you went and tried, tried this approach. Um, uh, obviously you can, you can go design a simulation, but remember uh, uh, simulations uh, are all, on, oftentimes not super easy to build. Um, they can be tricky, especially if you're simulating how other humans may act. Right. So, um, you know, theoretically imitation learning or supervised learning seems like an easy problem, right? And reinforcement learning seems like a hard problem. And we are, we are, we are seeing supervised learning is not quite working because of this covariate shift issue, but then reinforcement learning might be, uh, you know, trying to shoot a mosquito with a bazooka, right? So like, I think the, you know, the, the question is, is there something in the middle that, that we can do? Um, all right. Uh, if there are no other uh, ideas, yeah, there, are, there, oh, there, are are. People. there are plenty. Okay, awesome. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, I know. Uh, maybe using some uh, data aggregation, like uh, huh. instead of just using behavior cloning, you can add a stage two and um, let the learner to discover some new place and then add into the data set. Okay, you definitely are way ahead of me because that's what I'm going to talk about next. So, yes, that's a fine proposition. Um, cool. Uh, any more, though? Just just before else we could charge it. Oh, okay, we have so many. Any uh, other? Any other? Okay, if not, uh, let's forge ahead, but there'll be, there'll be uh, plenty more, more interesting uh, puzzles down the way. But, but yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for those wonderful, wonderful suggestions. Okay, so, um, right. So the, the, um, so the, the, sec the second suggestion was data set aggregation. Before we get to that, I guess, the, the underlying uh, theme that we are going to try to, leverage is can we interactively query a human on states the, the learner actually visits because the problem was fundamentally off distribution shift right uh, we were, the human visits a distribution of states that the robot doesn't visit so it seems like the, the the natural approach is to go fix that to get your training distribution to come closer to your test distribution the idea is how can we do this right um, and so I'm going to talk very briefly about this algorithm um, dagger, which is a seminal algorithm 
um, in the field of imitation learning. Uh, it's by Ross, Gordon, and Bagnell. Uh, so let's take a look at what Dagger means and why it works, right? Okay, so the Dagger algorithm is embarrassingly, it's a meta algorithm, it's an embarrassingly simple meta algorithm, right? Um, so it proceeds in iteratively. So in iteration zero, we ask the human to drive the robot. Okay, and so we collect this perfect driving example where the robot's right in the middle of the track. Uh, we then take this data. So think of data as pairs of state and actions, right? And we train our favorite uh, model um, and we get a policy, why not? Okay, um, maybe this policy is really bad, right? Uh, as we saw before, okay. In iteration one, we're going to do something different. We are going to take the policy that we just got and ask the robot to drive, uh, drive the car. And as expected, the car may go off the road, um, but that's fine. We're just going to take that data and we're going to ask the human a question that is what action they would have chosen if they were to uh, you know, actually be, be at various stages uh, at, at various states along this trajectory, right? So the, ask the human for corrections. Um, then we're gonna take this new data that we generated at iteration one, and this is the critical bit. Uh, we are going to add it to the old data that we had before, right? So we're going to aggregate data. That's where the name uh, data, data set aggregation comes from, right? And then we're gonna train a learner on this aggregated data to get a new policy pi one, okay? Um, and we repeat this process again. The, uh, we have a, uh, the policy pi one, drive the car. Again, it goes off the road, no worries. We get the human to provide corrections. We aggregate data, get a policy pi two and so on and so on. And um, the hope is that after many iterations, uh, we, we, are we are able to get a policy that drives like the human, right? Um, now, there's a, there's a bunch of theoretical reasons why this works, uh, but I guess you know, we don't have the time to go into that. So I'll, I'll try to abstractly give you some intuition of, of why it might work. Um, so let's go back to abstract state space. Uh, remember that we had a distribution of states that the human visits that's concentrated in a very tiny region of space. Um, so now let's take a look at the distributions that are traced out by Dagger. So in the first round, the robot goes all over the place and it makes many mistakes uh, since it doesn't know how to recover. In round two, it learns to somewhat recover. And by round four, this aggregated distribution is starting to concentrate, right? And by round 10, we see that this distribution has now completely concentrated in a much larger region than where the human visits. Um, um, and, and this is because even though the robot makes mistakes, it learns to recover and stay in a bounded set of good enough states. And uh, so the data theory posits that a policy that does well on this aggregated distribution also does well at test time. And so this mismatch is resolved. This is the, the high level idea of, of why this thing works. Um, Okay, good. So, um, you know, that has been out. I mean, it was a paper that came out in 2011. It's been, um, it's since then, it's been used in, in various approaches, uh, be it, um, you know, ways to uh, bootstrap reinforcement learning by imitation learning, um, you know, I, I, you know, be it uh, places where, you know, you're trying to train a learner to imitate a more expensive, maybe optimal control solver. Uh, this is, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, generalizations of Dagger and, and, and so on. But, um, but if we think about Dagger, not from the lens of its computational um, you know, qualities, but we look at it, look at this algorithm that we just talked about from the lens of practical utility as a practical imitation learning algorithm, um, there's a problem, right? So, you know, ask yourself, if you were the human and the robot kept asking you at every situation for what to do, 
this is this is going to be super annoying, right? It's not only a lot of strain and effort. Um, sometimes it's unsafe for humans to give feedback when the robot's driving. I mean, imagine you had a self-driving truck that decided to go on the wrong side of the highway and ask you, hey, what should I do? I mean, this is not going to be a very, uh, this is going to be a pretty stressful experience for us all, right? So let's think about how we humans learn from natural human interactions. And so a much more natural way that we humans learn is from interventions. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about this paper, EEL, um, that, that talks about how to learn from, uh, from human interventions uh, while retaining some of the theoretical aspects of Dagger, right? Um, so we conjecture that humans have a mental model of a subspace of states that's good enough. So as long as the robot is in this state, the human does not feel the need to correct. As the robot is about to leave the subspace, um, it's natural for the human to intervene, drive the robot back into the region and give back control, right? Um, so the question is, how do we turn this sort of insight into an algorithm to, for the robot to know what the right action is, right? And so um, the insight is that the human presumably has in their minds this latent value function that captures the cumulative uh, cost of taking actions and acting optimally thereafter, right? So every time they're intervening, they're giving us some information about this latent action value, right? Even if they're not, if they even when they're not intervening, they're telling us something about the action value. For example, hey, you're you're good enough. And so our approach, EEL, exploits this insight. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit of math to, to kind of communicate how we set this up. Uh, we're going to set up this problem uh, of learning from interventions as, uh, as a constraint, as an online constraint optimization problem. Um, so recall that we are solving for an action value function Q. Think of uh, Q as a function that maps state action pairs to real value. So the lower the Q value, the better it is. Um, you know, let's say we, in, we have an initial set of expert demonstrations, S star, A star sampled from, uh, you know, P of expert, which is a distribution that, that the human drives in. Uh, we can begin by initially trying to uh, correctly classify these demonstrations, right? So coming up, solving for a Q value such that the minima of the Q uh, corresponds to the action that the human took. Okay, now as the robot is executing its policy, we are going to end up with three types of constraints on this function Q. At stage one, when the human is not intervening, we can positively say that all the Q values are below a threshold delta. At stage two, when the human takes over, something bad must have happened, right? So then we can at least say that the Q values crossed a thresh that, that threshold. And finally, stage three, as the human drives the robot back, we can say that each of the intervention actions are locally optimal. So putting all of these constraints together, we end up with this streaming constraint optimization problem uh, that we can solve in an efficient online manner uh, to, to update uh, our Q values. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. Um, so, this is once again, uh, Jonathan with the robot uh, providing uh, uh, intervention. So you can see as soon as the robot gets close to the wall, Jonathan intervenes, returns back control. Um, and in the early trials, EEL fails just like behavior cloning because of the compounding of errors. But as it gets more and more interventions, it starts to get better and better. And then after simply 60 seconds of trials, uh, Eel is able to run without Jonathan intervening at all. And in contrast, you know, behavior cloning, um, no matter how much demonstrations we gave, it simply wasn't able to uh, complete a successful run. Um, okay, I'll pause here for questions, if any. Yeah, we have a couple. Awesome. So, what, so obvi obviously this, in this entails a lot of trial and error. So what, what sort of uh, things do you account for in implementing this on a real vehicle where 
a, an error means instead of picking up an RC car, uh, resetting a bumper and potentially murdering someone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a good question. Um, so I in some sense, uh, uh, let me try to describe how this process works on at Aurora. Um, obviously, Eel was a, a, a paper we did before I, I started working at Aurora, but, but some of the processes that we, some of the algorithms we apply uh, is, is, is very similar in flavor. So the way this works is, you know, you have a self, you have an 8,000 pound truck that's driving on the highway and you have a safety operator. And, um, you know, the safety operator um, is, uh, anytime the safety operator feels that the robot is, you know, doing things that uh, that is not correct and and are approaching a potential regime where um, controlling the robot uh, is, is going to be difficult the, 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 the safety operator intervenes right and um, and then brings the you know drives the robot back into a good enough regime right um, and then hands back control so they disengage from auto take over in manual you know, Correct, correct the motion or, or, or demonstrate something different and then re-engage auto and continues, right? And so the goal is how do we take this piece of intervention and turn that into updates for the various models that are running on both the robot, right? And so, you know, uh, I think the in spirit, like it, it proceeds in this sort of, in this sort of stage that I described, right? You can say, well, you know, the states that that when the VO wasn't intervening are surely uh, pretty good, and so you know, you look, you know, you, you want your algorithm to know that some sequence of actions that led to the intervention, right, was was fairly bad, right, and then you want to turn that as updates for you know, your various models that are that are making decisions, and um, and the third bit is that the recovery motion that the VO demonstrated. Is the is in fact the optimal thing to do from that, from 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 that state, and so you want to sort of use that data uh, to update the model. To, so that's where in stage three. So that's a general flavor of how things work, um, and obviously in the in in the real world, uh, you know, um, the the system has a lot of guardrails for you know it's not learning from scratch, right? Like uh, like when when you're engineering systems in the real world, you're you're engineering a lot of uh, lot of prior knowledge, um, things that you know obviously are bad, uh, you, you, you engineer that back in. And really the, the, the job of the learner is to figure out the more implicit rules of the road, the things that are more difficult to engineer in, you know, when to courtesy lane change, how to act when you have a disabled, you know, an emergency vehicle on your right shoulder, but then a contested start on the left, like how to make the various little trade-offs that, you know, we so seamlessly do, right? Yeah, so yeah, good question. Um, any, any more? How, uh, how do you mapping the correct action to each state? Because in the in a video that um, like in uh, during the initial iteration, the, the car mm -hmm. will hit a wall. And mm -hmm. do you correct the uh, do you uh, that, that's the ex, uh, expert correct the action after the car hit the wall or before mm -hmm. it? Because uh, if you hit the wall, then the robot mm -hmm. will not uh, not not know what to do before it hit it because the mm. uh, yeah just like that so you crack okay. each step or you crack it after it get a bad result okay uh yeah thanks for that question uh so maybe uh, let me answer in two parts first is i guess uh, what is the what is the mapping uh, for 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 these videos? What what is the mapping from states to actions? So you know this is simply an um, you know uh, here um, I guess you know we have uh, um, here you can think of actions as t step trajectories, right? And you're simply mapping given features of the scene. You're, you're, essentially, you're you're learning a, a cost for each of these trajectories, right? So you, you can imagine each of these trajectory. Uh, consist of features like, you know, what is the curvature? What is the speed? What is the deceleration profile? How close are you to obstacles? Um, and so on, you know, whatever statistics you think is relevant to, to, to score this trajectory, that's the feature. And then we are learning a mapping from features to actions. Now the question was um, about uh, when, when is the human, uh, when is Jonathan taking over for that? Let me just show the video once more. Um, so the idea is, um, yeah, the idea is, you know, this, there was no like rule that uh, 
you know, Jonathan was following when he was taking over. And he's taking over whenever he thinks, uh, I, mean, I mean, that's something that's cool about this result is like he's taking over whenever he thinks that the robot's about to be in a state from where, I think the intuition is from where the human, um, you know, if the human were to take over from that state, so this is the Q star, right? The optimal Q value, like that is unacceptably high, right? Um, so I think in some sense, when the robot's approaching some limit of recoverability, the, you know, he's stepping in and taking over and, and returning back to a good enough regime, right? And um, so I think when, I, I mean, not, not while the robot's hitting the wall, but I would say like maybe a second or so before it, such so that it gives him enough time to take over uh, and then correct the robot back and bring it back into a, a nominal state and, 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 and return back control. Um, yeah. No question. Okay. Uh, okay. My question is, is there any issue when you start changing like the human operators? Um, hmm. Like, let's say if you're a driver and at an intersection, I take any opportunity I can. And then another driver waits until the safest possible moment. How do you deconflict yeah. like very differing actions from the same input? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, so, you know, we different humans may have different latent cost functions in their mind. Like that's how it will show up in the math. And there's one of two things you could do, right? One thing, I mean, I, let me give the practical answer first, which is practically uh, at Aurora at least, uh, the, 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 the way the product drives is literally determined by the vehicle operators. They are uh, sort of trained to drive in a way that determines how we want the final robot to drive, right? Uh, so they can't, um, you know, they're trained to not have too much variance. I mean, tiny variances, they'll definitely have tiny variances in, for example, you know, the kind of standoff distances they maintain, right? Uh, there'll be fluctuations there uh, and, and that's okay. That's a good thing, right? You want to tell the system, you know, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, if your standoff distance is like, uh, you know, uh, six meters versus 10 meters. I mean, the, uh, in nominal settings, this fluctuation is totally fine. And, this, and the, the system naturally interprets this as a flattening of the, co of the cost or value function landscape, right? It just means that, you know, it really doesn't matter. Um, and so, so that's good. And that comes drops out of the math, right? And I, I suspect your question was, what if uh, users have fundamentally different preferences? Um, I think, you know, that's not a question that I've dealt with in practice, but in theory, um, what I what, what what I would try to do is try to figure out that you know each each user then has to have a latent variable that's attached to them that's indicating some some notion of um, you know their mode like their you know are they aggressive are they uh, are 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 they conservative or you know and and this doesn't have to be something that you explicitly code in. You're simply um, you're simply giving your algorithm a, a latent variable z, and then um, you know, in in some sense, trying to cluster the human feedback into different modes, and then train train value functions or policies or cost functions, whatever you have you for each of these clusters. And and uh, I think there are some approaches that that do that. For example, there's like a um, you know. There, there, there's this uh, uh, there, there's this sort of multi-user imitation. There's a body of work in multi-user imitation learning that all pretty much end up uh, and end up with this approach, and, and and I think that's a reasonable way to kind of proceed. Um, and this is not unique to imitation learning. Like, this is unique to any machine learning. Uh, right? Uh, you have language models. Uh, you would see that you know your auto-compose models, your recommendation systems are all. They all are are basically built on trying to cluster you into one of modes and then and then having models for each mode. So yeah, it's an interesting question. Okay. Um, all right, uh, let's keep going. Oh, one more question. One more question. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so, sorry. So I uh, just want to clarify between optimization and learning because I saw both the words appear on the slide. Um, are you using like um, in some software to solve the optimization after you collect the data or you're uh, still using the online learning? Is that uh, uh, okay, yeah, so, so, so in this context, let me just make sure I carefully answer your question. Uh, in this context, uh, when I say optimization, I'm simply meaning the, the, the solver you use to solve the, to minimize loss, right? Like nominally you would be using SGD to like 
you know, you define a ML loss and you use, use SGD, but like, um, you know, um, I think in the, in this, in this paper, since we know that, you know, it's, a uh, um, actually in this paper, we used, uh, uh, follow the regularized leader as our online learning block. So the idea is, um, uh, you sort of aggregate all this data and, um, you know, uh, you have linear constraints and, uh, yeah, I mean, if you had linear constraints and a quadratic objective, it would be a QP. So I, 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 I'm not, I don't remember exactly what we did. Probably, oh yeah, I guess we converted everything into an unconstrained hinge function and simply did SGD. So when I mean optimization, it's, it's the process you do to actually solve this minimize loss uh, in this context. I hope that clarifies. Yep, thanks. Uh, so I think uh, my uh, following question is, if you are using online learning, um, mm -hmm. Uh, is the data set starts from like empty and you collect data and put it into the data set? Because otherwise I don't think like um, 12 iterations of data collection will suffice to uh, change the whole iterate, change the okay, whole this, uh, No, 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 that's, that's, that's a good question. And so this is not like image to action. So, you, you know, the features, this is a very, um, this, is a, this is a very, uh, in some sense, small learning problem, right? Uh, the the you can think of the features here as being um, you know you're you're learning almost a uh, linear sc score for for over over various trajectories and so uh, you, you're essentially learning to weight different components of you know how much to penalize curvature versus um, versus proximity obstacles and so on so this is in, in some sense that's very simple and so you know you don't re and, and by the way twelve iterations each iteration is a trajectory where um, the the number of timestamps. So I think you're collecting data at 10 hertz. So if if an entire episode lasts maybe a minute or something, uh, that's still a lot of data, right? And so um, so 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 12, 12 iterations still means a uh, fair you know thousands of data points, and, and probably that's enough for. for, for awesome. Thanks. Uh, for the, you know. Awesome. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's continue then. Uh, just to quickly summarize the the first bit of the talk. So. We, our goal was to drive like a human by imitation learning. Um, we, um, we, we saw that we can't naively apply supervised learning even on the simplest of examples. This is because of the problem of feedback that the output of the robot feeds back in as input and feedback drives a covariate shift between training and test distribution. And you know, thankfully there's a fix. Instead of passively collecting data upfront, you need to interactively query the expert on the states the learner may visit. And we saw uh, a couple of simple algorithms like Dagger and Yield that does just that. Um, okay, so with that, let's move on to challenge two, uh, intent prediction. Um, we want to explore the question, how do we interactively forecast human actions? Some of this work is actually work that uh, we've been doing at Aurora uh, for, for for a while now, I guess. Okay, cool. So, um, so so far, right? We have been talking about the 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 loss function in some sense. We've been talking about how do we uh, learn the um, learn the cost function or the value function that the robot uh, uh, from from uh, you know feedback from the human, right? But uh, let's now move and move on to think a little bit about the underlying model. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> if uh, if we were doing the naive thing, which is trying to map image to steering action directly, um, I think all of you in this room can appreciate that that's a pretty hard problem, right? Um, you know, um, for some scenarios that might be fine, but for uh, for um, you know for very safety critical uh, situations where you where you're you're trying to Act in a very non-myopic way. This this might not work very well. You might you definitely need history. You need to carry around uh, a long uh, sequence of image frames. So, you know this, it's it's in general not not the best strategy. Um, instead, uh, what we do is we plan a sequence of actions, right? So we call a planner that looks at the looks at the world around and plans a maybe um, you know t-step control trajectory. Um, executes the first part of the trajectory and replan. So we follow a model predictive control like framework. Um, now, of course, to make this work, you need to forecast 
uh, the emotions of other actors in the scene. So, you know, um, if you think of your model predictive control like framework, when you're writing down the objective function um, at, at any given time, right, the cost function at any given time, you need to know, okay, where are other actors in the scene going to be so that I can cost uh, my, my, my AVs actions appropriately. And so you need a forecasting model, right? Um, so the question is, can we learn to forecast other actors? Um, and I'll try to show you why this might be not as straightforward uh, as it may seem uh, through a simple example that I really like, uh, you know, the example of merges. So, uh, you know, when, when, we, when we first learn driving, um, you know, merging can be often a very stressful maneuver. Um, and so it's, it's a nice example to think through. Um, okay, so the traditional approach in industry uh, or has been industry for quite a long time is to treat uh, forecasting as a different step from planning, right? You know, it's typically been historically you do perception, then you do forecasting, then you do planning. Uh, I think a lot of recent work has moved to jointly solve the prediction forecasting problem, but then most of these uh, systems still treat planning as a downstream consumer of forecasts. Um, and so how does this process go? Um, so it goes as, as follows, right? In step one, we go collect data to train our forecast model. So in our training data, you know, 50% of the time, the human is merging after the car and 50% of the time, the merge happens before. And once we have this data, step two, we train the latest greatest forecast model to predict the future, okay? so. Sounds really simple, uh, right? Uh, but this approach completely fails. Um, so here's what happens uh, when, you, when you run this in practice. Um, this forecast looks like one giant blob that's spread across the front of the robot. Um, they have a huge variance. And as a result, the planner is left with no choice but to break heavily to avoid this blob of, of, of uh, act, uh, actors' future emotions. Um, and that's not good, right? So what happened? Why did the forecast look like a huge blob? Um, now, as you might have guessed, uh, this is because the value function um, uh, actually has uh, two modes that we care about, right? Uh, or rather, the forecast has two modes uh, that we care about. In mode A, you have the uh, AV uh, yielding to the actor, right? So the actor goes ahead of the AV. And in mode B, the actor yields to the AV. So um, when we train a forecast model on all data, it's, it's sort of averaging over these two modes and giving you a marginalized uh, forecast, right? Um, and so that looks like one entire blob. Um, now, at this point, uh, a common answer is, oh, okay, why don't you just have a, have a forecast that can uh, you know, reason about multiple modes, right? And that's good, that's a good suggestion, right? You can train a mixture of Gaussians and hopefully that'll give you two modes. Um, but that doesn't quite solve the problem because the problem is um, you, you, you don't know, um, you know uh, the, these, these modes depend on what on the decisions that the AV is doing, right? Like if the AV is choosing to yield to the actor, you, you pretty much know that the actor is gonna go ahead of the, uh, of the AV and, and vice versa, right? And so the key observation is that what the robot does depends on other humans, right? That is why we need forecasting for planning, but then what other humans do depend on the robot. Um, and so, this is commonly known as the chicken or egg problem of forecasting and planning, right? To do planning, we need forecasts, but to generate forecasts, we need to know the plan. Um, okay, so let's look at some more examples to see, see how, uh, how this can um, play out when you have more than one actor in a scene. So we're gonna do a exercise, uh, which is a, this is a sort of a simulation that, that of, of a real world incident like that happened uh, Couple of years back, and maybe you can you can help uh, debug what happened. So, so in this picture, uh, you have the AV uh, and the green carpet 
uh, shows the, the planned actions of the AV. And so this is a, a typical unprotected left. You have pedestrians uh, that are crossing um, and you have oncoming cars that are, that are waiting to either you know, go straight, take right turn, take left turn and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna play this video. Um, and uh, the AV did, the, the robot did something wrong here. And I'm wondering uh, if someone can help me figure out what, what the robot did wrong and uh, why the robot did what it did. Any, any takers? So just, just, just to give you a little bit more context since you know, there's no camera data, so it's hard to like tell what's going on. Uh, you see the AV come up to the intersection. Um, uh, there's an oncoming car. Uh, there's some pedestrians just crossing and the AV very confident says, ah, I can make this unpredicted left turn, no problem. Um, and it does a very, uh, a very famous maneuver in Pittsburgh. It's called the Pittsburgh left. Uh, for those of you who might've driven in Pittsburgh, I think this is, this is not so surprising. So um, yeah. Any volunteers? Hey, yeah. Awesome. Thank um, you. It probably assumed that uh, the oncoming car wouldn't um, actually go ahead of the car in front of it and or cross the yellow lines, but it did. Uh, so it's unprotected. Interesting. So yeah, that's good. So the oncoming car that's coming out behind that one. Yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good sign, right? Like um, it it probably assumed that yeah that that car is definitely not going to conflict with me anytime soon so I can go ahead. Um, that's that's a problem that's perhaps not the most egregious problem though why this was uh, a wrong move. And anybody else like to try? How about like, I guess um, from the perspective of the first oncoming car, why is this like a bad kind of a jerk move that the AV did? Uh, what's going on? What do you think is going on with the kind of the first oncoming car that reaches the intersection? The one that looks like it's going to take a right turn. Well, for, for one, the, the ego car doesn't, doesn't see that it's about to take a right turn because it's clearly waiting for the pedestrians. Mm. And also the ego car doesn't do a very classic thing where a lot of times if you're turning left in an unprotected left, you pull out into the, a bit more into the intersection and forecast mm. that I'm about to turn whereas the ego car just goes for it. Awesome, that's such a, I, I like the second part of the answer re, really well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So to, so you're right um, that, you know, the um, the ego car comes up here. Um, it, it doesn't quite, it doesn't understand the scene. So what's ha actually happening is that car, car turning right is waiting for the pedestrians to finish crossing, right? And it's expecting, okay, once you finish crossing, I'm gonna go. Um, the ego car looks at this right-hand car, and at this time in in this simulation, you know, it's just reasoning about it independently. It thinks, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure this this car is not planning to go. Like, it's just it's just planning to stay stopped for whatever reason." So, you know, in from the AV's perspective, it's like, "Yeah, the you know, as soon as pedestrians are gone, no one's waiting for me. The roads are all clear. I'm clearly, I clearly have the uh, you know, um, the." Uh, uh, I, I'm clearly the actor that should be making this motion and, 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 it, uh, and it goes for it. When, when in reality, what it should have done is realize, you know what, the car turning right has the right of way. It's probably being nice and waiting for the pedestrian to completely finish crossing over. Um, and it should have been able to infer that the right sequence of motions is, you know, the pedestrians to finish, then for the car to turn right and then for it to go. And probably by that time for this, this oncoming car would have um, made its way all the way. So like it should have waited for that second oncoming car, right? So anyways, the point of this exercise is that what, what you just went through is what we do several times in a day, right? We look at problems that occur on the road and try to figure out, you know, what, what, we, what we as human drivers think should have happened, what the robot, you know, did wrong. And 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 what's missing in its in the way it reasons uh, about the world that's that's um, you know what what could help fix this problem right and so the idea is the robot's not really interacting uh, not really reasoning in this scene at this time about the um, actor actor interactions in the scene right 
Um, and so we're gonna talk about how we build a model that does that. Okay, so uh, we saw forecasting and planning is a chicken or egg problem. Uh, you can't do one or the other. So, um, so let's 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 now look at a a, a more uh, a more interesting example of uh, of a left turn, right? So you know you know this is a busy intersection with vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians, and and this is an example where we did get it right. So. Um, you know, this is after uh, after we applied our model that, that I'll talk about in a bit. So um, we see that, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here. So let me just sort of break it down. We see that uh, the, the robot's actions depend on what other actors in the scene are doing. So we need to yield for the vehicle that's turning right, um, as well as pedestrians crossing the intersection. And moreover, there's an oncoming car that's also waiting on the robot to determine when it can attempt its own unprotected left. Right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of actor actor dependencies. Um, and so we see that all actors in the scene influence each other. The robot is simply the actor in the scene that we get that we get to control. Um, and so we need to jointly reason over all actors in the scene to produce forecasts and subsequently our plan. Well, that sounds good. Uh, the space of joint trajectories is massive. So uh, each trajectory is its own t-dimensional vector of waypoints. So if we have n actors, this space becomes exponentially large with n. Moreover, even you know this doesn't directly address our chicken or egg problem of you know should we do forecast first and then planning or planning first and then forecast, right? Um, and so our key insight is that this continuous space of possibilities is actually misleading. There is an underlying discrete grammar in which we are reasoning, uh, what I like to call modes. It is these discrete modes that makes joint reasoning tractable, right? So what are modes for driving? Um, so we define three fundamental modes that, uh, uh, that, that occur over and over again based on the future motions of actors. So um, you take two actor, A and B. If, if you know that, uh, that, that they have a conflict and B arrives first, uh, we say that actor A is yielding to actor B. Otherwise, if A arrives first, we say that actor B is yielding to actor A. And finally, if there's no conflict, we say that both actors are not yielding to each other. And the cool thing is pretty much all of self-driving can be described using this grammar of modes. Um, and so to see a very quick example, let's go back to merging. Let's say we have the robot R that's yielding to actor A and an actor B that yields to R, right? Um, so this implies an ordering between actors A, R, and B. Um, and if I, if I were to tell you this sentence, right? R yields to A, B yields to R. Um, knowing this, we can forecast all three actors forward. In fact, we can go pretty much further to say that a mode corresponds to a single basin of a forecast. So uh, more generally, if we were to take this multi-agent game and write down the value function for all three actors, that value function will be multi-modal, but, um, but this sentence specifies a particular mode of the value function, right? Um, so uh, let's go back to the unpredicted left turn that we saw, and let's abstract away the scene by a graph. Um, imagine each actor as a node in a graph. The edges of this graph tell us relationships like, is actor A yielding to actor B? So it tells us the mode, um, uh, that mode of interaction between two actors, right? Now, given a set of decisions by the robot, right? Let's say the robot decides that it's gonna to yield to both the pedestrians and, 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 and pins down those two, uh, those two edges, right? Uh, we are going to infer decisions made by the other actors with respect to each other uh, by essentially passing messages on the graph. For instance, we can infer that this, the, this car wants to turn right, but is yielding to pedestrians. Um, and as a result, the robot must yield to the car who has the right of way. Finally, the um, oncoming car is actually turning, oops. Uh, right, okay. 
right? So yeah, so, and once we know these modes, we can predict future motions for all of these actors, condition on the mode and information from neighbors, okay? And once we have this forecast, we can then call our favorite planner, you know, ILQR, whatever MPC method you use to go compute a plan. Um, so we put all of these ideas together using a multi-stage graph neural network, which we call geometric transformer net. Um, so uh, the, the word transformer here refers to uh, how you do aggregation of information on the graph. Um, so the idea is that you have a graph neural network where uh, you know, the nodes are actors. So you have features of, of, of each actor that can be the current state and history of an actor. And the edges are features that describe relationships between actors. So transforming one actor from one frame to the other. Um, we then encode these features and do K rounds of message passing on the graph. Uh, think of message passing as, uh, you know, every node in a graph is simply transmitting its features to other nodes. And then a, a node receives information from all its neighbors and aggregates this information and updates its own state, right? And we do this K times. Um, and finally, we decode this, this sort of hidden vector into two outputs. Uh, first, we predict uh, discrete modes for each edge. So which, you know, who yields to whom or not yields. And, and based on this decoded uh, uh, interaction, we predict T step trajectories for each node, right? Um, and that's pretty much it. This is, uh, this, is the, this is the model that runs online to, to predict what uh, actors might be doing condition on decisions that the AV uh, makes, right? So if you go back to the scene, um, we see that um, by reasoning about different modes, the robot's able to navigate through this intersection. You know, the interesting thing about this video is that uh, as the robot's making this unpredictable left turn, a cyclist pops out from behind an oncoming vehicle. So, you know, the robot has to, in real time, perceive this, this actor, incorporate it into its forecast and create a new plan to execute this turn safely, right? So this model has to be running online at, at fairly high frequency. Um, uh, let's, let's, let's go back to merges since that's what we started this discussion with. So, you know, this is an example where the truck is trying to negotiate a merge with other actors. Um, and you can see the slots appear to be fairly tight, right? So it has to adjust its speed and negotiate with these actors to open up a slot in a stream of traffic. Um, then we apply graph neural network and infer, uh, the following modes, um, and based on this reasoning, the robot chooses to slow down and merge behind the first two vehicles while the third vehicle uh, makes room and merges in behind as expected. Um, cool, so the exciting thing here is that this is a production model that is running on the road all the time, right? And, it, and every day it's getting tested on, 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 on lots, hundreds of miles of data on the road and, and millions of miles in simulation. So, um, you know, this model is at, is at the heart of uh, how the robot understands what actors in the scene are, are going to do. And, you know, the more data we see, the, the better it gets. Um, all right, uh, questions? Um, I have a question. If uh, you said that most of the uh, things like, for example, the cyclist appeared out of nowhere, so all of the things uh, decisions may be done online and some kind of uh, feedback may be received by the system. So uh, let's assume that uh, uh, some uh, autonomous vehicle is driving in a region that is prone to people uh, taking wrong decisions or uh, uh, not following traffic rules. Then uh, maybe uh, if we compare another car which comes from an area where uh, the drivers usually drive in a more civilized fashion, uh, is it possible that the uh, policies learned by both autonomous vehicles would be somewhat different? Uh, I mean, if you uh, technically put both of those cars or their algorithms in the same position, they might do different decisions because one car was driven in a region where um, mm -hmm. the drivers are more prone to taking uh, uh, breaking traffic rules or something like that. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, let me try to attempt to answer that question. Um, I, I should first preface it by saying that um, it's not an it's not an unreasonable question. I think uh, from what we've observed, you know, um, rush hour traffic is very very different from you know driving in the middle of the night. Um, and so the way actors respond or drive around the AV certainly changes as, as the day progresses, even in 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 in, in the same uh, in in a same place. Same place. So I would say that um, it's good to separate out what what we are learning, you know, uh, in, into two chunks, right? The first part of the talk, I talked about how the robot should act, right? And that's primarily based on imitating uh, the expert vehicle operators. And the second part of the talk, we're talking about, hey, how do other humans respond to the robot's motions? And that's sort of not under our control, you know, humans will do what they do, right? And so, you know, the, the this, this sort of, Variance problem that you're alluding to doesn't really occur in the first part of the talk. I mean, there was a question about multiple types of users may have different preferences, but really we have just, when we're doing imitation learning, we're imitating unimodal kind of a vehicle operator, right? So really this problem occurs in the second part of the talk when you're trying to predict um, what other actors are doing. I think what, what we have found is if we, if we simply, uh, I think if we, if we have, you know, a sufficient history of what an actor has done, you know, maybe five second history, um, and and some features about the scene. For example, you know, the graph neural network knows has an idea of the congestion in the scene, right? Because uh, you know, the if, if, in a congested scene, you have lots and lots of actors in close proximity, right? Um, these two together, it's pretty reliable in predicting what an actor would do, right? Um, so you know. Um, now, it is true, like if you set up two identical scenarios, one where an actor is like breaking rules, the other it's not, um, the model today is going to average over these scenarios, right, it's going to predict something, something on average. Um, there's nothing, yeah, um, there's, there's, no, there's nothing, uh, at, at this point, I mean, that, that's an acceptable, um, acceptable uh, hit that we take, right? But if this were to become a problem, what we would do is we would, we would I mean, the, the way forward is to condition on some con con contextual bits, right? Like you and I as humans would be able to like condition on maybe that region, right? Even though that's something we try to, we avoid doing, right? Conditioning on what geography, geographical part of US we are driving, right? But, um, but, uh, but I mean, if, that's, if that truly were a limiting factor, that's what you would do, right? You would try to condition on on, on something about that scene, so that condition on that your your predictions become more accurate. Um, but yeah, uh, anyways, that, that's that's a, that's a good question. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Okay. So, um, yeah, oh, go, go on. Let's, uh, so can you go back to the? Yes. Uh, the uh, increment on the PowerPoint for the last slide. Yes, please. Uh, hang on, oh, where's my mouse? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, which... uh, yeah, I, I just want to ask, how do you implement the for, um, forecast? Thing that like you you have to predict a trajectory of p time ah, stuff, right? yes yes uh, do yes, you yes, use yes. An, uh do you use a uh, rnn or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. that's a great question we, we we do use an rnn yeah so i didn't talk about the decoder uh and that's what the question is referring to um yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, the, the 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 decoder right now is an rnn um i think in general um there i mean I, this is not the topic of the talk but i could give a whole other talk about how uh, you know how uh, what what the design choices are? I mean, one of the things we are trying to experiment more with is essentially using um, transformers because, as, as, you, as you you know, for those who work with RNNs, know that RNNs uh, can be problematic when it comes to vanishing gradients and so on. So one of the things we are trying to do is to to sort of use more transformer-like models to decode, um, you know. Not oh, so it's not just an producing. overview, and there are some details to be improved in this encoder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the point being that um, 
Okay, from a more practical question right now, we don't, um, the, the forecasts are good enough for planning to plan, right? Like the forecast may not exactly say what a user did. They may not, they may not also sometimes be super plausible, right? Like they may dynamically not be as smooth as you would like, but as long, but you know, these forecasts are, are simply serve the planner by um, by being good enough for for us to get the right planning behavior, and so really uh, in, in in the real world, uh, you know, you know, uh, you don't fix it till it's broken. So like, uh, even though we're experimenting with it, it's it's in a good enough basin where it's it's giving value. So um, yeah, um, oh. I think I, I suspect as we do more complex. Uh, uh, you know, uh, tasks or, 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 or drive for, or, or encounter more long tail scenarios, we probably need to make this, this decoder better and better. But yeah, thanks. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, with these forecasts, you, you would have a probability that the other agents could go left, right, straight. And so are yes. you just showing the dominant probabilities here? Ah, that's a great question. So, so, uh, so what, what happens is even though the forecasts are multimodal, when um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, say condition on um, the so 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 condition on the decisions made by the AV right we're trying to figure we're trying to infer what is the most likely mode uh, for each for each actor in the scene right and the hope is and this is thus far been true that once you've inferred what mode you know for example who the actor's yielding to, who they're you know going ahead of, who they're ignoring, and so on. Uh, you've kind of you kind of push the forecast into a singular basin, and you know that doesn't mean prediction error will be zero. It can still be non-zero, but it's good enough, right? You're 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 in in the right basin. Your your forecasts are not trying to average over different modes, right? And so, um, so so the, these bl these black lines are essentially showing. Um, motions um, um, of that correspond to the the inferred modes uh, that that, that uh, yeah that the models inferred. So if we go back, like if we we now revisit, like you know the Pittsburgh left violation kind of scenario, we don't have yes. to go to the slide. But then, yes. uh, so how do we know that you know using this model that you know that are we replaying that or you know what what kind of i mean different uh, yes. like you know uh, companies have different ways of replaying and adjusted replay but what's yeah. what's this more simpler way of knowing that okay this and variations of this kind of problem are now let's quote unquote solved with this forecast based mechanism yeah no that's a great question um so uh, let me first say why uh why that, that question is more fundamental rather than a tooling question. So yes, uh, you know, like like all other companies, we, we log all our data um, and we have the ability to evaluate the model on log data. But if you were to simply evaluate the model on that on that log data, you know, we um, uh, the the model will only uh, we can the the ground truth corresponds to an incorrect action that the AB did. In some sense, we don't have a counterfactual. We don't have ground truth of if the AV had yielded correctly, what would the other actors have done? And this is a, I think this is a problem that plagues everybody. Open loop. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so I could give you like how, how we deal with this problem at, at, in broad strokes. I think one, one way is uh, increasingly through, um, you know, relying a little bit on uh, simulations. So, you know, we have a, a you know, we have a dedicated simulation team that tries to make more and more realistic actors. Um, and sometimes for, for cases that are not super complicated, the simulations offer, uh, offer, offer some help in, in at least gut checking the models. Of course, um, you know, um, of course the simulations are, are, are synthetic, uh, like the simulations in turn depend on other models, right? So, so, so that's not really a, a surefire way to check your model. The, the other thing we try to do is just, um, you know, go, go search through our data points for similar examples, but where things evolve differently and, and, then, and then check, you know, check model that, okay, I, I can look at a log, I can condition on the right interactions and see if my predicted forecast match the ground truth. So that's, 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 that's mostly the mechanism we use, right? Um, and, uh, and, and finally, like, 
the final bit, which is which is the important thing, is ultimately these forecasts are evaluated to make sure that the planner would do the right thing rather than you can predict what each actors are doing. And I think this is a key bit uh, that only very recently the forecasting community is waking up that their metrics of um, average displacement error or, or any such error is, 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 a, is a good start, but not the thing we actually care about. What we care about is, you know, what was the consequence of your wrong forecast on what the planner did, right? And so the way, you know, I mean, the sure shot way to do that is to actually create a simulation from an event, run the planner with the forecast, evaluate what, how the AB did and, 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 come on, and, and you know, uh, go from there. So anyway, that's sort of the broad stroke picture of, of how, how we try to evaluate models. Yeah, it's a good point. Thanks. Awesome, cool. Uh, so I think we're almost at the end. So let me just sort of, uh, go through and uh, summarize. So yeah, so that was the second part of the talk. So we, uh, you know, our goal uh, was to, um, you know, predict uh, the intent of human um, and, um, uh, but we, we, we realized we can't naively forecast other humans independent of what the robot will do. This is because, the robot affects what other humans will do. This is the chicken or egg problem of forecasting. Um, and you know, thankfully there's a fix. Instead of independently forecasting each actor, you, you can design algorithms that interactively forecast actors with what the robot will do. Um, um, and we saw how using a graph neural network, we can do just that, uh, creating a set of self-consistent forecasts. Um, and so yeah, these are the two challenges that we talked about today. Um, and while we only scratch the surface in this limited time, I think understanding these two questions at a deeper level, uh, it, it goes beyond driving. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of this is, 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 has implications on personal robots, which is uh, you know, primarily what I'm looking to work on in, in the lab that I'm starting at Cornell. And with that, I would love to acknowledge the amazing co-authors and collaborators involved in the work I presented today. Particularly, I would love to acknowledge the uh, entire team at Aurora for working tirelessly towards the amazing product we have today. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd love to take any questions uh, um, that you might have. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there are some questions. Awesome. Yeah, I have a question regarding the imitation learning part of it. And um, so I had a question, the first part of the talk basically. So the, you spoke about how the, how your stack is built around the safety drivers taking control at times. So uh, we obviously discussed different drivers and stuff like that, but uh, how do you handle edge cases with that? Because if there's a safety driver, obviously as soon as the truck starts to sway a little bit, he's gonna take control and just get it back on track or something like that. But uh, let us consider if there's some case where there's rain and the truck slips due to some reason and reaches an mm -hmm. edge case. My, mm -hmm. the, the generalized mm -hmm. version of my question is that uh, imitation learning turns out to be a rote learning approach. So there's still a probability that you might end up in a state that you've never visited. So how mm -hmm. do you handle edge cases like that? Yeah, great question. So, uh, so I would say that um, that um, at a broad level, I think we, we, we tend to have this notion of imitation learning as mapping states to actions that I think is incorrect. And in fact, some of my research, in fact, one of the papers that we recently published at ICML trying, is, tries to unify this entire field and, and really set, you know, pushes out imitation learning as not, not, not just telling you how, what to do it, it's, you know, not a mapping from state actions, but really as, um, as uh, as uh, giving you information about um, the, 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 the distribution of states that the, that the human visits, right? And so um, you can say that, you know, if the robot's visiting states the human is not visiting, it's clearly doing something wrong. Like it's, it, it doesn't need to be going off into and exploring other states, really. That's, that's not the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to match the distribution of states that the human visits to the distribution of states that the robot visits, right? And, and so you can view imitation learning from this very fundamental notion of moment matching. And I think that is underappreciated and, 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 uh, and, and, and I think adopting this framework can help you 
not think of imitation learning as, oh, how do I map states to actions, but oh, how do I um, how do I come up with a policy such that I'm not the, the the I'm matching sufficient statistics of what the human is doing, right? So I am not coming closer to cars uh, more than what the human is doing. I'm not bound breaching lane boundaries. I'm not slipping off roads as much as what the human is doing, right? That being said, your question is an excellent one, which is uh, the the problem of um, the problem of um, you know uh, the the that rare events occur well are rare, right? They occur very rarely in your data. And you, you can have 99.99% of the data that you collect is, is could be very boring highway driving, but then there are 0.01% you know, of very exciting data. And you really wanna make sure you, 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 know, you, you got that bit correct. Um, and so um, the ways to tackle this problem is to make sure that your, your data is um, bucketed in terms of context, instead of like treating your data as one monolithic data set, you're you're actually you're actually bucketing your data. We you, we use the word context, but like contextually bucketing your data. And I would say that you know slipping off the road in a, when there's black ice is definitely one context, right? That and 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 so and I, and the goal is to do well across all context, uh, right? Instead of um, the distribution over con at which the close contexts appear, and that's like the key shift, right? So you would you you would um, that 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 automatically would imply that you would do things like upweight data, uh, upweight contexts that don't occur as much, but you know you do really really bad in them. So you should you should really focus your learning on doing well on those contexts. So I think that's 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 how that's how we sort of think about this mismatch data issue. Um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of, okay, like for when you're slipping off the road, what, how do you know what the right set of actions is? That's a fantastic question because the human might not have encountered this at all, right? And so the way we do that is, is a lot of this is through, the first thing we do is always try to create lots of simulations of this event uh, and, and lots of tests to cover. Uh, so, so we know that the robot is, will actually fail in these situations. Uh, so that's the first thing that we do. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as with all practical systems, there's a lot of engineering that goes on to make sure that your learned models are interfacing, are, are uh, have guardrails around them, right? And and so maybe to deal with these icy situations, they're, they're probably uh, like, um, you know, simple things you could do. I mean, that's more of a control problem. So not really outside the, not outside the purview of what I do, but like I would imagine, you know, you can come up with, um, uh, uh, reasonable controllers that could perhaps deal with that issue. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say the analog to what you're saying from a decision-making standpoint is when, you know, pedestrians just randomly, you know, when a child randomly jumps in front of the car, right? And so, you know, the, the, the way the system is built is uh, it, you know, the system at any time, at any time, preserves a set of safety constraints, right? It preserves the ability to stop or to swerve to avoid collision. And, and, and so these are these are what we call guardrails and the learner has to live within these guardrails. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an adversarial system. Like simulation team is to find out regimes where the, where the planner is not doing well, create unit tests. And you know, every, every new GitHub PR that we are landing is being checked against these unit tests. And you know, if it's not doing the right thing, we go and engineer it and then eventually, um, Eventually, hopefully, collect some data and train a train a system to like recover or something like that. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Oh, I think that that was really great, Sanjeev. Thank, thank oh, you thank so you. much. Yeah. Let's let's give him a hand. No. Oh. Yeah, thank you everyone. This was awesome. Uh, like I, I love the questions. They're really thoughtful. Uh, yeah, and um, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing uh, checking out the website to see all your final cars in action, uh, and hopefully seeing it in person uh, sometime. But yeah, this is great. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much. Yeah, we'll definitely share the final projects also with you. Cool. And, and I'll I'll follow up with you one on. Yeah, and and if 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 you have any further questions, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, shoot me an email. Um, you know, it's on my website. I'm happy to try to answer any any question that I can. But yeah, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.